The second strain is a more Burkean strain, and that's a conservatism of the temperament, a party steeped in religion, and the conservative awareness of sin. When Dwight Eisenhower was 10 years old, he wanted to go trick-or-treating, and his mom wouldn't let him. And she said, and so he threw a temper tantrum and punched the tree in his front yard so badly that the skin was rubbed off his fingers. She sent him up to his room, had him cry for an hour, came up to him, and said to him, I quoted a verse, he that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who taketh a nation. And 76 years later, writing his memoirs, Eisenhower said that was the most important conversation of his life because it taught him there was inner weakness and sin within himself and that he had to practice discipline and self-restraint. And those values, that awareness of sin, that awareness of how complicated the world is and how little we can know about it, informed his generalship and informed his presidency, emphasizing the virtues of prudence, self-restraint, balance, order, and maturity. You compare John F. Kennedy's inauguration address to Eisenhower's farewell address. Like Kennedy's speech is a, like a great liberal progressive speech, properly celebrated. The liberal confidence and the ability to organize things and plan change. Kennedy said, man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty. We'll pay any price, bear any burden, meet any harness. Together we'll explore the scars, conquer des deserts, eradicate disease, maximal de demands. Three days later, look at Eisenhower's speech. It's not about that boldly going forth. It's about balance, balancing the private economy and the public economy, government and the individual, spending on the present, spending on the future. The idea is that politics is a competition between two partial truths, and what's needed is prudence and balance. And so these are two great strains going through the Republican Party, the social mobility with government help and the temperament of balance. So where are we today? Where's the little girl who's like today's Lincoln, who's trying to rise from poverty to nothing? Well, she faces a different world than he faced. Today, she can't just make some money ferrying people across the Ohio River. She grows up in an economy that creates much more harsher cognitive demands on her and gives her much less social support. She's probably growing up with a fa without a father in the home. She's probably growing up in a chaotic community with low social trust, high social disorganization. She's probably gonna need language instruction so she can have the verbal facility to su succeed in school. She's probably gonna need to be cushioned from the economic and social stresses that produce self-control. She's probably gonna need a series of local institutions that will teach her how to build relationships so she can use adults as tools for learning. She's probably gonna need community colleges, colleges. She's gonna, probably gonna need to spend 21 years in educational institutions to prepare her for bottom or for middle class jobs. And so what does the Republican Party offer today? I think it offers her almost nothing. We have a party that's become a think tank and talk show abstraction obsessed party. And it's, you've got these matrixes that dominate conservatism in the current Republican Party. It's government versus the market, government is bad, as the economy is good. Well, maybe if you're an executive at a chemical company, maybe big government means more pain. But for, your, for this little girl, big government is not her problem. Her parents look at government and they see them as vehicles for them to work harder and rise, which is why Asian Americans voted three to one for the Democratic Party. The next stage the Republicans tell her is that a rising tide will lift all, all boats. This was the theme of Romney's campaign. If we can include lower taxes, uh, corporations hire more, you'll get the incentive structure right, and the economy will grow. And of course, there's a lot of truth to that. But I think she and her parents know that it is no longer the case that a rising tide lifts all boats, and the evidence of the last 30 years show that to be true. In an era of unequal human capital, it just doesn't work that way anymore. And so we've had a Republican convention in Tampa and the Romney campaign, which was a convention of successful entrepreneurs that talked about makers versus takers, party of individualism incapable of uttering a complicated thought on the subject of community and social capital, a, co a party that has become so anti-government, it has trouble expressing a positive view of government and therefore has trouble expressing a positive agenda. If opposing government is your primary agenda, 
then you really have nothing to say to large parts of the country. And so naturally, people look at you and they say, they don't get me. What about the Burkean modesty of Burke and Eisenhower? Seems to me that's not the GOP today either. I covered Michelle Bachman, Newt Gingrich, Rick Perry. I listen to talk radio. I don't see the prudence and the balance. I don't see that in the party's ideological enforcers. The country certainly doesn't think so. The Republican Party is now at its 20-year low in public esteem. And what's the single biggest objection Americans have, according to a Gallup poll last week, to the Republican Party? That objection is, quote, it is unwilling to compromise. Unwilling to compromise on guns, on immigration. I covered Bob Bennett of Utah, who was voted out of office because he co-sponsored a piece of legislation with a Democrat. I, the, the party I covered, often in the primaries, was almost in a moral panic. Sometimes it reminded me of the receding roar of a white America that's never coming back. And so my argument is the party has to move, not to the center, not to some mushy middle, but toward rediscovering what conservatism was, American conservatism, which starts with a layer of Burke, starts with a layer of modesty, cognitive modesty, moral modesty, awareness of sin, but because we're Americans and not Europeans, adds on the mobility of Hamilton and Lincoln. And rediscovering those two things to me, are the essence uh, of where the party has to go and where conservatism has to go. Thanks. Well, I, I too am glad to be here, needless to say, I hope needless to say. There are a lot of microphones. I have one here, and there's one there and there, but if I'm over uh, I apologize. Uh, so I'm faced with the question of uh, whether to respond to what David said in his opening statement or say what I was going to say. And uh, I think there'll be time to engage in all this, so I might share the thoughts that I jotted down earlier today. Uh, let me say something about the Buckley program. Thank you so much for doing this. I regard the Buckley program as what Bush 41 called a point of light. And I also think of it, this is more my own language, as an inroad, a conservative spec in a different kind of environment, something that adds to diversity. And I'm so glad the Buckley program exists. Um, David said a couple of autobiographical words. Uh, I might as well. Uh, uh, to paraphrase Bill Buckley, I was born with a left-wing spoon in my mouth. I barely met a Republican that was in my 20s. I was taught that conservatives were uh, ignoramuses and racists and that they were callous and warmongering and so on. And uh, I grew up and found it wasn't true. And uh, I must say I was very surprised to be what is today called a conservative, even a right winger. I didn't set out to be one, believe me. It was an extremely uncool thing to be in my time. It pretty much marked you as a pariah. But I'm afraid that the facts of life and the tide of life pushed me in that direction. So uh, I find myself a, a senior editor of National Review. It wasn't planned, trust me. And <clears throat> in considering this question of the future of conservatism, it occurred to me that, um, well, there will always be conservatism, won't there? Uh, I'm sure there's been conservatism in every time and place in all human history. It's, it's a constant, I gather, in human thought and, and human affairs. Uh, I thought I might say something about definitions of conservatism and liberalism. They get a little bit topsy-turvy, and we use these words differently in the English-speaking world and, and beyond. Uh, I consider myself a genuine liberal, but in my time and place, I am called a, a conservative right-winger or worse. Uh, in Australia, as you know, the Reaganite and Thatcherite party is the Liberal Party with a capital L. So that's why you heard from our mainstream media in the last decade, for example, about that terrible right-wing, Bush-allied, warmongering Prime Minister of Australia, leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, to our north in Canada, the Liberal Party is more of a socialist party or a social democratic party, a Tridopian party. Uh, people like me in Europe are sometimes denounced as neoliberals or even hyper-liberals. But, um, <clears throat> When I say conservatism in the, in the American context, I really mean uh, Reaganism. I consider myself a Reaganite, or to use Dick Allen's term, a Reaganaut. And uh, what do I mean by Reaganism? I mean limited government and personal freedom and free enterprise 
and a strong defense and American primacy in the world, or at least leadership. I mean what were once called traditional values. I mean um, uh, colorblindness, a pluribus unum, one America, an end to a racial or ethnic spoil system, an end to balkanization, that sort of thing. And I also mean American exceptionalism. That's that which makes us different from Europe. And a lot of people have always, from the beginning of America, resented this difference and been a little bit embarrassed by it or a lot embarrassed by it. Certainly everyone I grew up around, all the people I was taught by, were deeply embarrassed by American exceptionalism. And to be more like Europe was to be closer to God, in a way, or their concept of God. So when I speak of conservatism, I really mean Reaganite conservatism. I, uh, I thought of Bill Buckley today, uh, I've, I've cited this a lot. He would often ask people on television and, and off camera a question that vexed him a great deal. He was always asking people, how do you account for the success of socialist politicians in free and democratic countries given the manifest failure of socialism and the manifest success of freedom, including a free economy? And he was never really satisfied with an answer, but Jean Kirkpatrick one day gave him a pretty good one. She said, their language is better than ours. Their words are better than ours. They get to say fairness, social justice, caring, community, solidarity. We're all in it together. What are our words? Freedom, self-reliance, personal responsibility, enterprise, daring, growth. Uh, those words can be very off-putting. Uh, very scary. I myself, I must tell you, am not naturally entrepreneurial, quite the opposite. I'm what some people call a wage eater. I, I depend on the entrepreneurial for employment and for economic growth and other things. If we depended on people like me, we would never get off the dime. I'm grateful for such people and I think the demonization of them is unfortunate and wrong. But uh, freedom, particularly in economic, economic freedom, is a hard thing to talk about on the campaign trail. Much easier to talk about uh, fairness, uh, compassion, social justice. Maybe you're not doing so well because someone else is doing better and dishonestly, these richy riches, they've gotten ahead dishonestly and they owe you something, so let's have some leveling. That's much easier. Phil Graham, the ex-Texas senator, uh, told Bill Buckley one day that he, here he had been an economics professor. He said he never spoke of trade, of free trade on the campaign trail, ever. And Bill said, why? Why don't you sell it? He said, impossible because free trade benefits almost everyone and they don't know it. And free, free trade disadvantages a few and they all know it. So it doesn't pay politically to talk about it. 